Welcome to this morning's seminar. It is a privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dave Wasserman. David Wasserman is the U.S. House Editor and Senior Election Analyst for the nonpartisan newsletter, The Cook Political Report with Amy Walter, and a contributor to NBC News. Founded in 1984, The Cook Political Report with Amy Walter provides analyses of U.S. presidential, Senate, House, and gubernatorial races. The New York Times called the Cook Political Report, Cook Political Report with Amy Walters, a newsletter that both parties regard as authoritative. Wasserman analyzes the current political environment and his data-driven forecasting looks at both national and local trends, the relationship between consumer brand loyalty and voting, and what the future holds for American elections. You're in for a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, you're in for a treat today with his presentation entitled, Where Are We Headed? The Future of Gerrymandering and Politics. Please help me in welcoming Dave Wasserman. Thanks very much, Mike, for that uh, generous introduction. And thanks to all of you for having me. I hope it's okay if I hang out down here with, with you guys. Uh, first off, I, I want to let you know I really appreciate your product. Uh, just please don't tell my rabbi that. Uh, but, uh, but no, uh, uh, breakfast sandwiches have been great. And now I'm going to ruin breakfast with politics. Just kidding. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to analyze this in a timely way because uh, the, the new congressional and legislative maps from Minnesota just came out yesterday. So I, uh, I just updated my slides, uh, and, and we'll dive into what it means for, for this fall. We've certainly got a lot to cover. You know, many years ago, a group of political scientists came up with a fancy term for how voters are feeling right now. And let's see if we can pull that up. Uh, this is pretty much uh, how the electorate is, is, is feeling uh, heading into the midterms. No one's really that happy. Uh, the country feels adrift. Voters in 2020 uh, wanted, by a narrow margin, normalcy over what they had perceived as chaos in the, last, uh, in the, in the preceding years. And yet, right now, Americans are frustrated with uh, shifting guidelines and mixed messaging from the CDC, uncertainty about whether wages are going to be enough to cover rising costs and inflation, and uncertainty over our future uh, in foreign policy. Uh, if Russia invades Ukraine, is that going to add another dollar to the price of gas, right? And it, it, so when you when you analyze how Republicans, Democrats, independents feel about the country, uh, they're ready to move on uh, from, uh, from this un uncertainty. Uh, they're ready to get back to normal. But Republicans are fairly united uh, on the question of, is it time we accept COVID is here to stay and just get on with our lives? Of course, 89% of Republicans agree. Independents aren't too far back. 71% say the same thing in the m most recent Monmouth University poll. Uh, but Democrats are still b badly split at 47-51. Now, of course, public opinion on this is changing rapidly, and now you're seeing even blue states lifting restrictions. It's possible that most of the country will, will feel like we're somewhat beyond COVID in the next month or two, given the plunging cases. And yet, uh, Americans' anxieties are not limited uh, to COVID right now. And Democrats are demoralized. The agenda in Washington on their side has stalled, uh, whether it's the large social spending plan that Democrats have attempted to pass, uh, whether it's changing to voting laws, changes to voting laws. And meanwhile, independent voters, those who don't see themselves as members of either party, feel as if the agenda in Washington is disconnected from the problems they face in their everyday lives, whether it's uh, uh, business uncertainty owing to supply chain, issues that they perceive Washington is slow to confront. And the 2020 election was not a mandate for uh, Joe Biden and Democrats. It was more a narrow rejection of Donald Trump, but it was actually a fairly close election. Now, you can look at the popular vote that, uh, that, that uh, uh, we had in, in 2020, and, and Joe Biden uh, won seven more million uh, votes, uh, which is a bit different from in 2016 when Donald Trump 
uh, lost the popular vote by 2.9 million. They won the same number of electoral college votes. Both Joe Biden and Donald Trump won 306 electoral college votes. But if you add up Biden's margin in the three states that put him over the top in the electoral college, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia, he won by a cumulative margin of 42,915 votes out of 159 million cast in the country. The margins in American politics are exceedingly small. You can't get much closer than 43,000 votes in a presidential election. You can't get any closer than a 50-50 Senate. You can't get much closer than a House that's got a nine-seat margin right now. And so just tiny shifts in public opinion can make an enormous difference. And Democrats have virtually no margin for error. They, they, they can't afford to lose hardly any ground uh, he, uh, from 2020 when they're heading into a, a, a difficult midterm environment. In retrospect, I don't think a different Democratic nominee could have beaten Donald Trump in 2020. Biden was about the most moderate Democrat uh, that they had. And the country is extremely politically polarized. It's hard to change minds uh, these days. And the, the way that I've always thought about this is in terms of the relationship between uh, consumer patterns and retail behavior and, and voting. And so for the last 10 years, I've had this, this theory. Uh, and it's based on a study that I did uh, back in, in 2011 that analyzed which retail chains were the best predictors of where Democrats and Republicans live and voted. What I did was I merged a database of county by county election results going back to 1992 with a GIS application that could map out every retail chain with at least 100 locations nationally. And what I found was that the leading indicator of where Democrats were gaining strength in the electorate was Whole Foods Market, but that the leading indicator of where Republicans were doing better year after year was Cracker Barrel Old Country Store. Now, just to give you an idea of how far the country has drifted apart over the last 30 years, here's some data. Back in 1992, when Bill Clinton won the White House over George H.W. Bush, he carried 59% of the counties that today have a Whole Foods market and 40% of the counties that today have a Cracker Barrel Old Country Store. That was a 19-point culture gap. That gap went up to 23 points in 1996. In 2000, when George W. Bush won the White House over Al Gore, uh, he won 75% of Cracker Barrels and 44% of Whole Foods. That was a 31-point gap. That gap went up to 39 points in 2004. It was 43 points in 2008 when Obama carried 78% of Whole Foods and 35% of Cracker Barrels. It was 46 points in 2012. I didn't think it could get much wider than that. But in 2016, Donald Trump comes along and he wins the White House, winning 74% of Cracker Barrel counties and 22% of Whole Foods counties, a 52-point gap. I'll never forget, uh, a couple months before the 2016 election, I was speaking to a group of young professionals outside of Washington, D.C., and it was a pretty yuppie, liberal crowd. And there was a young woman in the front row who actually asked me, uh, excuse me, David, have you, did you mean Crate and Barrel? I've never been to, I've never heard of Cracker Barrel. And uh, to me, that that foreshadowed the 2016 election result. But Joe Biden was supposedly going to be the Democrat who could close this gap. He, for his whole 50-year career in Washington, he had built this reputation as the patron saint of the blue-collar Democrat. He was the guy that Barack Obama sent out into tough rural districts to campaign, where Obama himself thought that he would be a liability. And so if any Democrat was, was going to bring the party back in rural Minnesota or in, in a lot of states that helped decide the presidency, like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, it was going to be Joe Biden, right? Except in 2020, Biden actually ran up the score even more in Whole Foods country. He didn't really bring the party back that much in Cracker Barrel country. We actually had a wider gap. He carried 85% of Whole Foods counties and 32% of Cracker Barrel counties. And so our urban-rural divide got even wider. And uh, I, was, I was curious, after the 2020 election, whether these two chains are still the leading indicators, because after all, a decade had gone by. So what I did was I ran this analysis down to the precinct level. And what I found was that, indeed, there are two new leading indicators for the 2020s that have overtaken Whole Foods and Cracker Barrel. Anyone want to guess what they are? 
Chick-fil-A. You'd be surprised at the number of Chick-fil-A's in, uh, in, in you know, urban democratic areas. But uh, all right, so I'll, I'll, give you, uh, I'll, I'll give you the answers here. For Democrats, Lululemon Athletica, uh, and for Republicans, the Tractor Supply Company. Now, in 2020, Biden carried 86% of counties with a Lululemon, and Trump carried 79% of counties with a tractor supply. Now, uh, I, I know uh, very few of you have been to tractor supply, and all of you are yoga enthusiasts here, so uh, I'll, I might have to explain to you uh, what, what these are. But, uh, no, I mean, it's, it's easy to look at this and say, well, this is just a proxy for, for uh, this urban-rural split, and that's largely true. But uh, actually, both of these chains' biggest growth areas is the suburbs. And uh, tractor supply, they're not just selling to farmers. They're selling to weekend warriors who live in suburban subdivisions who want to convince their spouse that their riding mower is sexy. Uh, but just a word of warning for those of you who are, uh, who are yoga enthusiasts in uh, this pork audience, uh, there are three things in, in my book that always tell the truth, and those are small children, drunk people, and yoga pants. So uh, just be warned. All right, so where do things stand today? Well, here's a chart of President Biden's approval rating in an average of polls compiled by a site I like called 538.com. And you, you can see that well, for half of, 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 uh, of the, his first year in office, his approval rating was actually pretty good. That was his honeymoon phase. Uh, and yet the lines really crossed when we got to uh, Afghanistan. And that disastrous pullout was the moment at which the independent voters in this country uh, lost faith in that competence card. You know, when he ran, he said, the guy in the White House uh, uh, has less experience than anyone who's ever been there before. And I, have, I would have more experience. We're facing a whole series of challenges, and I got this. But when we pulled out of Afghanistan, and we lost troops, and, and we uh, um, mistakenly hit civilians, uh, that was the moment that <clears throat> I think uh, voters who are not hardcore partisans started questioning his competence and his capacity to handle major issues. That, and it bled into perceptions of, of his handling of, of other problems as well. If you break down uh, his, his approval by issue, uh, we've seen huge double-digit declines on a variety of fronts. On COVID-19, back in May of 2021, when it looked like we were coming out of this the first time, he had a 57% approval rating on handling of COVID. Now, just 44%. Obviously, a lot of factors out of his, his control. And uh, if Americans are feeling better by this summer, maybe his approval rating on, on COVID goes back up and it's less of a problem. But that's not his only problem on the economy. 52% in May of 2021, 42% now. Foreign affairs, 47% in May of 2021, 40% uh, now. And that could, that could go down if, if we are uh, engaged in, uh, in this no-win situation on the Ukraine-Russia uh, border. Immigration, which has always been the weakest issue uh, for the administration, 43% in May of 2021, 33% in January. Uh, Democrats have really suffered as a party uh, for moving left on the immigration issue. It's, it's what really helped uh, Donald Trump get into the White House in 2016, and the Republican message really writes itself. Uh, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are talking more about sending reinforcements to Ukraine uh, than, than our own border. And that, of course, is, might be an oversimplification, but it resonates with the voters that Republicans need. Now, typically, uh, once a honeymoon is over, uh, it's, it's over. Uh, we haven't seen a president come back uh, during a midterm election year from having a 41 or 42 percent approval rating to get back over 50. Now, I think if somehow this, the rest of the year goes well for Democrats uh, and he gets back to 47 or 48 percent approval, then we can start talking about Democrats having some narrow pathway to keeping their majority in the House or Senate.
but as it stands now, we're in democratic wipeout territory. And, and uh, that, that would be good news for, uh, for Senate and House Republicans, and including uh, Mr. Cruz, who uh, um, was caught trying to go to Cancun last, last year. So another big problem for, for Democrats is that Republican anti-Biden intensity has surged. Uh, I, I found this picture of, uh, of a welcome sign uh, right here in Minnesota uh, that, uh, that someone took some creative liberties with. Uh, the Pew Research Center poll uh, found that 73% of Republican voters didn't just disapprove of Biden, but strongly disapprove of Biden, up from 62% a year ago. The most recent NBC uh, Wall Street Journal poll found 61% of Republican voters rate their interest in the election as a 9 or 10 out of 10, compared to just 47% of Democrats. So we have an enormous intensity gap as well in interest in the midterms. And this is showing up in some of the, the elections we've, we've recently seen results from. Uh, in November, we had two governor's races in New Jersey and Virginia, where in Virginia, a state that Biden won by 10 points, a Republican, Glenn Youngkin, won by two. In New Jersey, the Democrat Phil Murphy uh, still hung on, but he only hung on by three points in a state that Biden had carried by 16. So we had a 12-point swing in Virginia, a 13-point swing in New Jersey. And if you were to apply that to the entire country, uh, if the same thing were to happen this fall, then Republicans would pick up four Senate seats and 47 House seats. They only need to pick up one Senate seat and five House seats to regain a majority. Uh, that's, that's pretty... That's a pretty massive swing, and I don't think Republicans will make gains of those sizes for reasons I'll, I'll explain in a minute, but it does give you an idea of the magnitude of just how, how, how much things have shifted since Democrats took office, and, and anger is a stronger motivator in politics than love. It, you know, it's, it, midterm elections are kind of like calling customer service, right? Do you, do you wait on hold for 45 minutes to talk with someone if you're happy? With, with you know the job that the airline did on your last flight, no, you call them because you're pissed off that they lost your bags, right? Who's going to show up to vote in an off-year election? It's going to be people who are angry with the way things are going. In 2018, that was Democrats. Now what we're seeing is that the hostility that Republicans are feeling towards uh, towards Joe Biden rivals the hostility Democrats were feeling towards Donald Trump in 2018. And looming over it all is a certain unemployed gentleman at Mar-a-Lago who has some free time on his hands this year. And what's interesting is that his priority seems to be retribution right now. It seems to be purging the Republican Party of those who crossed him in any way, rather than simply helping Republicans get back into the majority. Mitch McConnell has one agenda. Kevin McCarthy has another agenda. They badly want to get back in, into, you know, uh, into the majority leader and become speaker. But where is Trump focused? It's on beating the people who voted to impeach and convict him. And actually, that, that shouldn't surprise us that much because the historical pattern has been when the out party takes back Congress in a midterm, they tend to overreach, and it actually helps the incumbent president win another term. We saw that with Bill Clinton. You know, Republicans won in 1994, they, uh, but, but Bill Clinton won re-election in 96. Republicans took back the House in 2010, two years into Obama's term. Of course, we know how 2012 ended up. Obama won re-election. And so Trump might think, well, if we've got Marjorie Taylor Greene and Rand Paul and Ted Cruz running the show or the, being the face of the party, in Washington for the next two years, maybe that's not the best situation for my uh, prospects in 2024 if I want to come back. And so uh, he has his own agenda, and that might complicate a few of these races. Let's get into the battle for the House and Senate, and uh, we'll touch on what's going on here in Minnesota. Um, but history off the bat tells us to expect Republican majorities. The average loss for the party in the White House in the post-World War II era has been 26 House seats and two Senate seats. I mentioned earlier Republicans only need five House seats and one Senate seat. And when you look at the Senate map, this is Republicans to lose. If, if you were to run placebo K 
candidates on the Democratic and Republican sides in every Senate race, I think Republicans would pretty much sweep the competitive battlefield as long as Biden is still stuck in the low to mid 40s. But there are seven races that are really going to determine which way the Senate ends up. And there are three races where Republicans are playing defense, four races where Democrats are playing defense. The three Republican-held seats uh, are Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, uh, where you've got uh, Senator Johnson uh, uh, running for re-election uh, right across the river. You've got uh, Pat Toomey and, uh, in Pennsylvania who's retiring, Richard Burr in North Carolina who's retiring. Democrats want to pick up these seats. But in Wisconsin, uh, Democrats have a very competitive primary they need to get past first uh, between a scion of the Milwaukee Bucks empire, Alex Lazary, the state treasurer, Sarah Godlewski, uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. Uh, and so they're going to have to drain some of their own resources before they even go after Johnson. And uh, he's been underestimated before. I'd keep him a narrow favorite for re-election there. Pennsylvania, both sides have very brutal primaries. I think the favorite on the Democratic side is Congressman Connor Lamb from the Pittsburgh area. Uh, and the Republican primary is going to be the most expensive, brutal primary in the country uh, between a hedge fund billionaire named David McCormick and, uh, and a certain uh, personality from TV you might know as Dr. Oz. Uh, well, more on that in, in a second. North Carolina, Democrats... Uh, are united behind uh, a, a, a black former state Supreme Court Justice, Sherry Beasley, uh, and Republicans have a, have a very fractured primary between the former governor and a more conservative congressman. But North Carolina is a state that Trump carried in 2020. It's hard to see how Democrats flip that state when Trump won it in an election that he lost nationally. Now, on the other side of the ledger, you've got four vulnerable Democrats, and they are uh, uh, a pair of senators who won special elections uh, and now must run for full terms, Raphael Warnock in Georgia and Mark Kelly in Arizona. Uh, Republicans have a pretty famous front runner in Georgia and former Heisman Trophy winner Herschel Walker. Uh, and in Arizona, Republicans have a, a really nasty primary underway that Trump has not yet waded into. Uh, in Nevada, Catherine Cortez Masto might be the single most vulnerable Democrat. Republicans are pretty united behind uh, former state attorney general Adam Laxalt. And then Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire is probably in the best shape of the vulnerable Democrats. Uh, the popular governor there, Chris Sununu, decided uh, he wouldn't run against her. Uh, Republicans have kind of a weaker bench right now, but that's still a state that could flip in a very good year for Republicans. Now, as I mentioned, I think in a, all things being equal uh, in terms of candidates, Republicans would sweep these races. But Republicans have also shown an ability to screw up two-car funerals before. And the biggest problems that I see on their side right now are, uh, are Dr. Oz and Herschel Walker. Now, Dr. Oz is running uh, in Pennsylvania as this, you know, every man in a barn jacket uh, but he took a break the other day from the campaign trail there on the lower left uh, side to kiss his new star on the Hollywood Walk of Stars. Uh, and he, most importantly, uh, he has not lived in Pennsylvania since he went to medical school at Penn. He's been living uh, right across from New York City in New Jersey. So we'll see how that goes over, but that would be quite the carpet bag. Same issue with Herschel Walker in Georgia. He hasn't lived in Georgia really since, uh, since he was a Georgia Bulldog. Uh, he's been living in Texas. And he's been very open about struggling with dissociative uh, identity or personality disorder. Uh, he once, uh, uh, he admitted to once holding a gun up to, uh, to his uh, ex-wife. Uh, he has been lately hawking a spray mist that supposedly cures you of COVID to each their own, I suppose. Uh, but uh, I think he, that's going to come under scrutiny. When he was asked by a reporter recently whether he would have supported the bipartisan infrastructure package that Congress recently passed, he didn't know what it was. And so will some of these newcomer candidates uh, be ready for prime time in these high-profile Senate races, or will they collapse under scrutiny? Uh, that's a, 
that's a key question for Republicans because we've seen it happen before, uh, particularly on their side. I expect Republicans to, to fumble the ball in at least one or two of these races. And I, I still think they'll win the majority, but maybe it's 52-48, not 54-46. Now, there are also a couple of open seats in the Senate that will determine the, kind of the ideological orientation of Republicans. Uh, you've got uh, Republican senators retiring in Missouri, Roy Blunt, Ohio, Rob Portman, Alabama, Richard Shelby. In each of these races, you've got some pretty, uh, pretty you know, far-right Republicans who are running against more establishment Republicans or traditional Republicans that Mitch McConnell prefers. An example of this is in Missouri. You've got the former governor, Eric Greitens, uh, who resigned in 2018 as governor after allegedly tying up a woman who was not his wife in his basement. And uh, we'll see whether he can mount a comeback in, uh, I'm not making that up, uh, in, in Missouri this year. But, uh, but that's a very crowded field. And, uh, and so then you've also got a couple of Republican senators who are facing primary challenges from farther right or more pro-Trump candidates who say that these senators are squishes for having voted to certify the 2020 election result. Uh, now, Lisa Murkowski is the most vulnerable of them. She's basically voted like a Democrat on the major issues that have come before the Senate, including voting to convict Trump. You can bet Trump is going to be uh, uh, holding a rally in Alaska at some point uh, for Kelly Shabaka, uh, her Republican opponent. Uh, but you could also see some important people in the ag world at risk as well, like James Lankford from Oklahoma or John Bozeman uh, in Arkansas, who's in line to chair the Senate Ag Committee. He's got a, a real race on his hands, even though he's been endorsed by Donald Trump. Uh, he just comes across as a really nice guy at a time when the Republican base is, is, is really angry and, and uh, maybe you know, out to send a message to even some of their own. Uh, now, Democrats' real problem uh, in the Senate comes two years later in 2024 when they've got, they've got eight senators who are potentially at risk, and there are virtually no Republican senators who are at risk in 2024. You've got three Democrats in deep red states, John Tester from uh, Montana, Sherrod Brown in Ohio, Joe Manchin in West Virginia, who I don't think runs uh, for re-election. You've got five other uh, Democratic senators uh, who could be at risk in swing states. So it's possible if Republicans do really well in the Senate this year, they could have a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate and be able to do whatever they want uh, in 2025. So that's why the margins uh, in, these, in these races really matter quite a lot. Now, in the House, currently there are 222 Democrats and 213 Republicans. And it's, it's districts like Minnesota's second that, have, that really make the difference in the House. I mean, had Angie Craig uh, lo uh, lost, and she came within two points in 2020, we could be talking about a different situation in the House. Actually, Pelosi came within 31,751 votes of losing the majority in 2020, which was quite surprising. Uh, the polls indicated last time that Democrats were going to do quite well. Instead, they ended up losing 13 seats. And there are a couple of reasons uh, why uh, McCarthy and Republicans have been doing well at the House level. First of all, in 2020, Donald Trump drove out millions of low propensity conservatives who otherwise never would have showed up to vote for your average Joe congressional Republican. Uh, and that lifted all the party's votes in, in unexpected uh, ways. But second of all, Republicans were also successful in recruiting candidates who didn't look or sound like Trump, particularly in the suburbs. Because you had this whole, you had millions of, of voters, particularly suburban women, who personally disliked Trump, but were open to voting for a Republican candidate who is not Trump, because after all, they didn't want Democrats going too far left in Washington. And, and all the polls said that Democrats were in line to control everything in DC. So, you know, even in, in Minnesota, uh, too, uh, where Biden won by, by seven points in 2020, Angie Craig only won by two points. You had nine districts where Biden uh, won at the top of the ticket, but a Republican won down ballot. And all 16 of the Republicans who flipped Democratic seats in 2020 
were women and or minorities. So Republicans these days are, are trying to recruit candidates who will defy the party's stereotype, right? And you know, Kendall Qualls might be an example of that in Minnesota, although uh, he seems to be a longer shot in, in the gubernatorial primary. But long story short, Republicans only need to flip five seats uh, to end Nancy Pelosi's reign as speaker. And retirements are, are accelerating their chances because right now, Democrats are dropping like flies uh, from Congress. There are 30 Democrats who have announced they're not seeking re-election and just 13 Republicans uh, who are not seeking re-election. The list of Democrats heading for the exits is longer than my arm. And some of those people are real losses for the Democrats, people like Ron Kind, uh, in La Crosse and Eau Claire, right? Uh, uh, he's been a, a very popular member for, well, since 1996, he's deciding to retire. Uh, Sherry Bustos from, uh, from Northwest Illinois. Uh, that, that's a, that's a, another seat that went for Trump, but also elected a Democrat down ballot. And so these are gonna be very difficult seats for, for the party to hold. Uh, you've also got uh, a couple Democrats running for statewide office, like Connor Lamb in Pennsylvania or Tim Ryan in Ohio. It could be hard for Democrats to hold their seats. So Republicans could take back the House just on retirements alone. But this is also uh, a case of, of a recruitment advantage. The water's really warm for Republicans to run at all levels right now. Um, you know, the message is, uh, if, if you're thinking about running, 2022 is the year to do it. And in fact, of the 21 Republicans who lost House races by less than six points in 2020, 11 have already announced for 2022, uh, including, of course, Tyler Kistner in the second district here. Of the 21 Democrats who lost House races in 2020 by six points or less, only two of them have announced they're running again in 2022. So Democrats have a full-blown recruitment crisis on their hands. They're not able to convince people to run this year uh, and Republicans are going gangbusters. This is also a unique cycle because we're in the midst of, uh, of redistricting and the uh, repercussions from the census. This happens once every 10 years. And this is a map from the census of which counties gained and lost population in the last 10 years. And uh, you'll see all this orange on this map. Actually, 52% of America's counties lost population between 2010 and 2020. And we had uh, larger counts in the cities and suburbs than expected, lower counts in rural areas. And Democrats point to this and they say, well, more power is headed to the places where we're doing well. Uh, and they also like, they also celebrate the fact that the country is, is getting more diverse. And it's true that the non-Hispanic white share of the population fell from 64% in 2010 to 58% in 2020. And Democrats look at that and they say, well, this should be great for us, right? We're, we're the party that's, that does a lot better with uh, minority voters. But in fact, the, the political balance in the country has not changed very much in the last 10 years at all. You know, the 4.4% uh, margin that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris won by in 2020 is hardly different from the 3.9 margin that Barack Obama and Joe Biden won with in 2012. And so what happened in the last 10 years that, that uh, negated the impact of, of uh, a declining white share of the population? Well, we saw Republicans make big strides with Latino voters. And as Latino voters, uh, those who are citizens and eligible to vote, uh, have become more assimilated into the country. They're beginning to vote more like the rest of the electorate. And you'll notice that in, uh, in 2016, Hillary Clinton won 71% of the Latino vote in the country. If you think back to 2016, what was Trump's message to Hispanic voters? Well, he hardly had one. He didn't run a single Spanish language ad. His message was build the wall, and by the way, Trump Tower makes the best taco bowls. Well, fast forward to 2020, and Trump's message uh, was robustly communicated in Spanish. It was that Democrats are the, are the party of socialism and lockdowns, and guess what? That resonated with 
uh, with a whole lot of that segment of the electorate. And so Biden saw huge erosion uh, in the most Hispanic parts of the country, particularly in South Texas and South Florida. And that means that two really big states are probably off the table for Democrats for the foreseeable future. Because if you, if you can't win big margins among Hispanic voters in Florida, if you're a Democrat, you probably can't win that state. And even though Texas is becoming more purple, if Democrats are losing so much ground along the border because they're perceived as mishandling the border crisis, that, uh, and most voters in South Texas would say that Biden is mishandling the, the border crisis, then uh, it's hard to, 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 to win statewide there. Now, in terms of which states are gaining and losing seats, Texas is picking up two districts, Colorado, North Carolina, Florida, Montana, Oregon, picking up a seat each. There are seven states losing seats, including California for the first time since statehood, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, West Virginia. Uh, but hey, Minnesota's not on this list. And it beat out New York for the 435th and final seat in the House by just 89 residents. If the people in this room hadn't handed in their census forms, uh, it would have cost Minnesota a seat in Congress. Pretty amazing. Uh, and also keep in mind what was happening in New York at, that, at the time of the census that was not happening really anywhere else. People were dying of COVID. Uh, it was really the first hard hit state other than maybe the Seattle area. And the date of the census was, was April 1st, 2020. So it probably made a difference in congressional representation. Now, the bigger impact from the census is going to be how the lines are then redrawn within each state. And this is a map of which party controls the redistricting process in all 50 states. Now, you'll, you'll notice that there are some states that are grayed out. Those are the states with only one district, so they're spared uh, the, uh, the brutal task of, of having to redraw their, their congressional lines. Uh, and then there are some states in yellow, which are the states with independent or bipartisan commissions. And actually, there are far more of those commissions in blue states, like California, uh, Virginia, Colorado, Washington State. Uh, and so Democrats you know, have, for years, been playing with one hand tied behind their back because uh, these commissions uh, prevent them from being able to gerrymander to their heart's content to try and win more seats. Whereas You'll notice all this red on this map, Republican states, mostly it's still up to the legislature how to draw the lines. And in all these red states, the legislature is controlled by, you guessed it, Republicans. So they get the power to redraw 20 states with 187 districts. Democrats only have the final power in eight states that total 75 districts. There are some states with stripes that have advisory commissions, but ultimately the partisan legislature has the final say on the maps. And you'd expect Republicans would be able to, to squeeze out an advantage from redistricting this year, given how much more control they have. But a couple things have happened that, that are pretty interesting. Number one, uh, Republicans found, have found out in a lot of the states they, they run that they can't draw a better map than they did, did 10 years ago. Keep in mind, a lot of these states are already gerrymandered in Republicans' favor. Uh, another thing is, Democrats got actually pretty good maps out of commissions in California and Michigan and New Jersey. And then also, uh, you've had court cases in North Carolina and Ohio where these state Supreme Courts that lean left are striking down Republican maps as unconstitutional partisan gerrymanders and replacing them with their own. The Republicans are complaining this is judicial activism, but the net effect from redistricting is it's actually pretty close to a wash nationally. Neither party is gaining a huge advantage overall. Just to give you a quick idea of how, how much gerrymandering has gotten out of control, this is the actual congressional map in the state of Maryland right now. And uh, you know, just like Minnesota, Maryland's got eight districts, except they look a little funny. Um, a federal judge uh, was considering striking down some of these districts the other year they pointed at the, the district in purple in the middle of the state, and uh, the judge said it looked like a broken-winged pterodactyl lying prostrate across the road. 
And uh, it, the reason it was drawn that way was Democrats wanted to draw a map that would give them seven out of the eight districts in the state, even though they only win you know, about 63% of the vote. Well, this time they've tried to draw a map that will give them all eight seats in Maryland uh, to offset, uh, or in their words, to fight fire with fire. Uh, now, this is the state of affairs in Minnesota, and this just came out uh, yesterday. Uh, the old map is on the left. The new map is on the right. And uh, in Minnesota, of course, congratulations, you guys, are the only state with a legislature that's split between the parties and can't make up its mind. Uh, you're not the only state, however, where uh, courts are drawing the maps, because there are five other states where you have a governor of a party that's different than the legislature. And so what happens when these people deadlock? Well, of course, courts have to step in and, and, uh, and rebalance the district lines. Typically, courts are very averse to making big changes that would upset one party or the other. They want to be perceived as neutral. Um, this time around, they made some significant changes. They, they, you know, it wasn't a wholesale makeover, but a, a couple things to note here. Uh, you have in the north, uh, Bemidji, uh, moving from the 7th district, which is Michelle Fishback, into the 8th district, which is Pete Stauber. Uh, that you know, makes Stauber's district a, a little less red, but not by so much that he would be in, in, in any trouble. The big question was always the 2nd district, which is, the most, which is really the only competitive seat left in the state. And uh, that 2nd uh, that district held by, by Angie Craig, a Democrat, uh, in, in the new map, it loses uh, uh, Wabasha and Goodhue counties, which lean Republican. But actually, you know, uh, Angie has made some inroads with Republicans, particularly in Goodhue County, so she didn't necessarily want to lose that. The court instead swapped in uh, Lesur County uh, in, in kind of uh, southwest of, of uh, the cities. So you've got a, a district that overall is about the same partisanship but she has to introduce herself to new voters. And I see this race between, uh, between you know, Angie and Tyler Kistner, uh, the veteran who, who uh, almost won in 2020, as a true toss-up. Uh, and one of the reasons why the race was so close in 2020 was that there was a legalized marijuana now party candidate who took a, you know, a, a fraction of the vote, probably siphoned more votes from Craig than, than Kistner. But this time around, if, as long as Biden's approval rating is in the low 40s, she's going to have a very, very tough time uh, winning re-election. So yeah, it's, it's one of the races that will help decide House control for sure. Uh, what's going on in some other states? Well, this is the current map in Texas uh, where Republicans hold 23 seats out of 36 right now. And you'll notice that some of the districts uh, in Texas uh, you've seen uh, become more purple and, and, and more uh, precarious for Republicans in the last decade because you've had so much Democratic vote growth outside of Dallas and Houston and Austin. So what did Republicans decide to do? Well, they said, well, the state's gaining two seats. So what we're going to do is instead of dividing Austin six ways uh, to, to dilute Democrats, we'll instead just put a new district in Austin that's 80 percent blue and draw a fence around the city so that we can shore up all the surrounding Republicans. And now in the new map, all those Republican seats are back to bright red. Uh, they've, got, uh, they've gone from Trump plus two to Trump plus 20. And you can do that pretty easily just by manipulating the boundaries. We saw Democrats do something similar in New York State. Now, there are currently 19 Democrats and eight Republicans uh, in New York. But two of those Democrats are pretty important people. You've got Hakeem Jeffries on the top right, who uh, is the number five ranking Democrat in the House, but he's widely assumed to be the successor to Nancy Pelosi when she steps down. Uh, by the way, you've got Nancy Pelosi, she's 81. You've got Steny Hoyer, the House Majority Leader, who's 80, 81. And the Majority Whip, Jim Clyburn, who's, who's 80. And this Democratic leadership team in Washington is like a testament to advancements in pharmaceutical medicine. Uh, <laughs> and then you've got uh, Sean Patrick Baloney, who's Democrats' campaign chair, uh, who's another congressman from New York. And they, they called their friends in Albany, the state capitol, and they said, look, 
Texas Republicans are gerrymandering their map. We need you guys to gerrymander the map here to give us more seats. And so they drew a map that is likely to elect 22 Democrats and just four Republicans by combining all the rural areas into, into heavily Republican seats so that the rest of the seats lean blue. So you know, when you add it all together, uh, we've got a competitive battlefield that has shrunk because the parties are trying to eliminate as many uh, uh, you know, questionable seats or, or, or uh, swing seats as possible and draw safe seats for their own side. You've only got maybe 20 to 30 races in the middle there that we view as really competitive. Now, Minnesota, too, is right there. Uh, it, it's a toss-up. Uh, but you, just a very narrow battleground. I think really only 25 out of the 435 House seats in the country are really going to determine who controls the House. And right now, I, I would say that Republicans could gain 10 to 30 seats. It's a wide range, uh, but uh, you know, uh, I'd say 20 would be kind of the median outcome if the election were held next week. There's also the question, though, of how many disloyal in the eyes of, of, uh, of Trump, Republicans will he purge from the party in primaries? And this could distract Republicans quite a bit in the months ahead. Now, a lot of the attention's been on Liz Cheney from Wyoming, who led uh, the Republican fight to, to impeach Trump and had, 10, or had nine other Republicans in the House go along with her. Uh, she is, I think, running a a Steinway campaign in Wyoming. What do I mean by that? It's uh, you, you put your name on the ballot and hope, uh, your, uh, hope a piano falls on your opponent's head. Uh, because I don't think she has much of a chance of winning renomination in a state that voted for Trump with 70% of the vote. And she's trying to get Democrats to cross over and vote for her in the primary. There just aren't too many Democrats in Wyoming uh, to do that. So you know, the media will fixate on that race. But really, I think it's other races that are lower profile that will have more, uh, more impact on whether the Republicans in Congress go you know, full on MAGA or whether they, re whether they go in a more traditionalist direction. Uh, it, there are, as I mentioned, 10 pro-impeachment Republicans. The only ones I think would, could survive are the ones like Dan Newhouse on the center left uh, who come from states with top two primary systems. What that means is uh, in Washington state where Dan Newhouse and another of these pro-impeachment Republican uh, members are from, Democrats can vote uh, in, in the, the, uh, and cross over in the primary and uh, in the general election uh, to help Republicans against other Republicans. And so he has a better pathway to reelection than some others. Then on the right, you've got you know, two examples of people in the House, Republicans, who crossed Trump in another way. Uh, both Rodney Davis from Illinois and Nancy Mace in South Carolina, they voted uh, just to certify the 2020 election results in Arizona and Pennsylvania. Trump doesn't like that. And Davis has been put in the same district in Illinois with another uh, uh, member who's a pro-Trump Freedom Caucus uh, figure named Mary Miller. And then Nancy Mace, uh, one of the party's rising stars, uh, was, she was the first woman to graduate from the Citadel, uh, but she has garnered Trump's ire. Uh, she's gotten into fights with Marjorie Taylor Greene. And you know, so these members have really tough primaries on their hands. And that will have an impact on what kind of farm bill could get written in 2023. Uh, I think Glenn Thompson from Pennsylvania is the, is the front runner to take over as as chairman of the Ag Committee in the House. He's a Republican traditionalist who I think would be a force of stability. But you can bet he's going to face pressure on, uh, on the far right end of the party on, on cur curtailing uh, food stamps and, and uh, the nutrition pr uh, title in the Farm Bill. So this is going to be a big fight that will in part be determined by races this year. And don't forget, we also have 36 gubernatorial elections on the ballot. Uh, Democrats are going to be targeting Arizona, Florida, and Georgia, although I don't think they'll take any of those seats. Uh, Brian Kemp and Stacey Abrams is going to be a high-profile rematch, but the fact that Kemp has actually angered Trump uh, might work in his favor in the general election. 
The Republicans are going to be uh, gunning for Kansas, Michigan, Nevada, the open seat in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. But Minnesota is still kind of at the periphery of Republicans' takeover list. Uh, we haven't seen a, you know, a, a high-quality poll of, of Tim Walz's approval rating in the last few months. But you know, I think it's right. It, on average, it's been 50 or a little bit above. Um, you know, good, not great. But the Republican bench in Minnesota has just been pretty weak uh, the last few years. They haven't had standout people run. And we just saw at the precinct caucuses, uh, State Senator Scott Jensen do pretty well. I'm not sure a, a, a doctor who has not been vaccinated will earn the trust of voters in a state that is overwhelmingly vaccinated. So uh, we'll see if Republicans can nominate someone else, but, uh, but uh, it's, it's an uphill battle for Republicans in Minnesota. And then also, uh, there are a couple of gov Republican governors uh, who face primary challenges for siding with public uh, health guidance during the pandemic, including Brad Little in Idaho, who's being taken on by his own lieutenant governor, Mike DeWine in Ohio, uh, who's being taken on by, uh, by a really pro-Trump uh, former congressman. Uh, and then, of course, everyone is wondering what the heck is going to happen in 2024. And uh, fortunately for us, this is still a few years away. Uh, but this might be a, a race that, that you know, we, we wait a long time uh, to develop. Because neither of these men has much incentive for showing their hand early on. Um, now, I think the pr actual prospect that these two guys run against each other again I mean, consult an actuarial table because both of them are in their mid to late 70s. And, uh, you know, I think there's a good chance that one of them will not be the nominee. I, I would give Trump maybe a 60 percent chance of running right now and maybe Biden a 40 percent chance of running. But neither is guaranteed. And uh, if Trump does run again, you can bet he will have a new running mate. Now, let's just say that Trump chooses not to run. Who would take over the Republican mantle? Well, I put the field into three buckets. Governors, senators, and former Trump administration people. And you might add a fourth bucket of, of kind of people who are social media personalities like Candace Owens, but uh, and we can never say never in this era. But in those three main buckets, I think Ron DeSantis is clearly the front-running governor. Nikki Haley and Mike Pompeo badly want to, want to do it out of the former cabinet types. But then my sleeper pick for the Republicans might be uh, another South Carolinian uh, who has quietly built a lot of appeal, Senator Tim Scott. Uh, I do think Republicans badly want to nominate candidates who break the mold of who people think Republicans are as stodgy old white guys. Uh, on the Democratic side, uh, Democrats have a real conundrum on their hands. A recent national survey found that just 24% of American voters want Joe Biden to run again in 2024. So even half of Democrats don't want him to run at the age of 82. So who would replace him if he doesn't? Well, I don't think he would have any choice but to endorse his own vice president, otherwise it would be basically an admission of failure that, that his administration failed, right? And yet, when Kamala Harris ran in the 2020 Democratic primaries, she couldn't light up a room with a blowtorch. She has not put together the skill set necessary to build a successful national campaign. Now, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez will be eligible to run for president by three weeks in 2024. She'll have just turned 35 years old. Will a self-avowed socialist have national appeal? Could she inherit Bernie Sanders' uh, coalition? Perhaps uh, she could inherit Bernie's coalition, but I'm skeptical about her national uh, appeal. And if you've got two pretty far-left Democrats competing, uh, I think there is a wide open lane for a more moderate Democrat in the Biden mold, uh, but it's unclear who that person is. Is it a Pete Buttigieg? Is it in Amy Klobuchar, uh, neither of whom could quite get over the hump in 2020? Is it another governor like uh, Gretchen Whitmer from Michigan? Is it someone more similar to the new mayor of New York City, Eric Adams, who is a pr 
pro-cop Democrat. That's actually you know, not a bad general election message. But a real conundrum on the Democratic side. I'll leave you with just one fact before I open it up for questions if we have any time left. Uh, no president has ever won a second term uh, that did not have a pet in the White House. Uh, and you know, there have been th only three presidents who, have, who did not have a pet in the White House. Uh, James K. Polk, Andrew Johnson, and Donald Trump. And neither of them won a second term. So this is, you know, everyone's talking about who will Donald Trump's running mate be, because of course it's not going to be Pence. And this is my prediction. Um, <laughs> Who's got a question? Yes, sir. Who is the most uh, electable Republican candidate for governor of Minnesota? Who is the most electable Republican candidate? Well, I'll be honest. I've not personally interviewed them. But at, at this point, you know, could there be some kind of unity ticket forged between some of the, the non-Jensen candidates in the race, right? Uh, I heard someone uh, earlier talk about the potential of Michelle Benson and Kendall Qualls getting together. You know, Paul Gazelka, I think, has, has built a respectable resume over the year, but does he have the charisma to build a successful statewide primary and general election campaign? Uh, it's just been a really, I think, weak bench over the years, and typically Republicans have needed uh, some some star power and you know to tap into that kind of Jesse Ventura vibe that upset the establishment um, uh, decades ago. Um, there's still time, but but uh, I think it's it's uphill for now. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, Minnesota should be a winnable state for Republicans by the numbers. Uh, and yet, you're absolutely right. It's, it's like they haven't been able to crack the code. One thing Glenn Youngkin had in, in his favor was tens of millions of dollars of his own money to spend on that race. Uh, and, you know, can Republicans find a candidate who would have that? Um, that would be a difference maker. But, uh, but it's, you know, different, kind of a different system here. In Virginia, I think there are a couple things going on that were unique. First of all, uh, Youngkin managed to come across as Mitt Romney to the business crowd. At the same time, he was able to, to, uh, to rely on a surge of Donald Trump voters uh, by just wading you know, one foot into that crowd just enough. And he, I think, is where the median voter is. He's a pro-vaccine, anti-mask. Republican. That's pretty much, you know, where the median voter in the country falls. You also had a retread Democrat in Terry McAuliffe, who is now one for three in Virginia gubernatorial elections and made a critical error in the final phase of the campaign when he said that he didn't think parents should decide what's taught in schools, that we should leave it up to professionals. Well, how did parents end up feeling about that? And I don't think Virginia was an endorsement of Republicans' message on critical race theory, so much as Youngkin's message tapped in with, into an overall frustration among parents that schools had been closed uh, for any period of time, really. And that's something that I think the rest of the country does share. But will it still hold as much salience in a 2022 election when schools are 
back open as it did in 2021 when the memory of it was still fresh. And I think that probably does work slightly in Walls's favor. Yes, sir. Uh, and the mic's coming your way. Number. But my question is this, uh, twofold. One of them, does that kind of a monetary balance almost guarantee re-election? And number two, uh, the extent to which the, uh, former President Trump has been in opposition to Cheney uh, indicate the extent to which that's not translated into uh, adequate financial support. You, you bring up a really excellent point. Trump has not built a fundraising apparatus to channel dollars into his and Dorsey's campaigns. And this is a really unique thing about, about Trump's operation. I mean, he, his, his question all along is pretty much, how can I profit for, or how can I benefit from, um, from a transaction in politics, right? And he was very shrewd in how he, he transacted to get to the top. But in the case of these primaries, uh, he has actually charged Republican donors hundreds of thousands of dollars to come to Mar-a-Lago and stay over and whisper in his ear about who he should endorse in these races. And so it's almost as if he's auctioning off endorsements, but then he doesn't go and hold fundraisers for the people that, that he backs. He, he sends out a statement, but he's not even on Twitter anymore, so it takes a while to get out. The, the people he endorses have to raise their own money to communicate that Trump has endorsed them. He might go out and hold a rally, uh, and that might be a difference maker for Harriet Hagman, the Republican candidate there. And you're absolutely right. Liz Cheney has $4.8 million in the bank, and her opponent has a fraction of it. But what, is she, what can she realistically do with that money? She can blanket the airwaves in Cheyenne and Casper for the next, well, the primary is in August, uh, six months. But what is she going to say? Uh, she's, you know, when I spoke with her, with Cheney's people the other week, they said, we're going to point out that she opposed Trump for the nomination in 2016 uh, and that she, you know, uh, what, she worked for a large energy company that built a project that some locals didn't like as an attorney. Well, last time I checked, Wyoming's electorate was a pretty pro-energy company state. Uh, and Liz Cheney uh, can't exactly, you know, Call the, uh, it can't be the pot calling the kettle black on opposing Trump. Uh, it's really difficult for her to thread that needle. And I, and I think given that she's in the low to mid-20s uh, in, in primary polling in a state that, where she has universal name ID, that's really, really hard to overcome, even with that money. Yeah. So the census was April 1st, 2020. Since that point, there's been a huge migration of people moving all over the country. Do you have any data or um, on how that is going to shift congressional seats that were just districted based off 2020 results, but the people who live there are not the same as was then? Good question. So we redraw districts every 10 years based on the census count from that single census date. And so the, the lines that are being drawn now they reflect where people lived in April of 2020. And you're absolutely right. Uh, it doesn't reflect where people necessarily live now. We saw, uh, if you look at the county by county map of the November 2020 election result, uh, Democrats actually made pretty big strides in places where people have second homes. Uh, we saw them, uh, Joe Biden moved the needle about nine points uh, in kind of the Traverse City region of Michigan Guess what? A lot of people from Chicago and Detroit uh, spent their pandemic there, and they ended up registering to vote there. Now, it wasn't enough to move the needle in those districts. Those are still pretty deeply red seats. And I doubt I could pinpoint a single congressional district where I could say, well, there's been a lot of movement of, of liberal city slickers to this district, and it's really changed the complexion of the race. Uh, I do think people are tending to congregate in the same types of places with amenities they like, whether it's breweries or, or lakes or just, just you know, beautiful scenery, rather than an even 
you know, dis dispersal of, of people to lower cost of living rural areas. So the effects, if any, are probably pretty concentrated. Going once, going twice. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you very much uh, for, for what you do. Uh, it's going to be a wild ride in politics the next couple of years, and so your engagement in it uh, as, as um, members of, of the ag community is going to be critical to uh, who gets elected, how a farm bill gets written, uh, and uh, if anyone's got a question that we didn't get to, I'll be happy to stick around for a few minutes, but, uh, but thank you very much for having me. And, and, uh, Enjoy the rest of the conference.